When I think about the black consciousness, I close my eyes and, and think about the unifying factors that tie my existence to a people with an oblique history. I think about how I would have felt at a time when natural law and substantive law were at odds against the displaced African. I think about how this displacement transformed into determination, a permanent plan to remove the cast iron shackles that impeded our progress. I do find that we are connected because those shackles are now invisible. And the only key is found in the language of the oppressed. Now, linguistically speaking, I'm referring to insurrection against the protection of white imperialism. I'm talking about living beyond the last breath. I'm talking about educating young leaders for tomorrow, as did our ancestors. Now, in 1788, Two decades after our Declaration of Independence, a black man only known as Othello wrote what has been deemed as the first recorded protest against a practice of stealing or bartering for human flesh. An excerpt of the essay reads, when the United Colonies revolted from Great Britain, they did it upon the principle that all men are by nature and of right ought to be free. Can they so soon forget the principles that then govern their determinations? Slavery in whatever point of light is repugnant to the feeling of nature and inconsistent with the original rights of man. Now, this sentiment is the core of my black consciousness, along with millions of other displaced Africans that found a permanent place in America. And I'd like to introduce you to one of those leaders, a man amongst boys within the burgeoning, the then burgeoning genre of hip hop, an educated activist, author, publisher, lecturer, producer, MC, icon, an intellectual, one of my personal greatest heroes, a present day Othello. Please welcome my brother, Mr. Chuck D. How are you, man? I'm fine, man. That that was <laughs> such an intro, man. It's like, um, <laughs> And it's a long time coming for us to actually touch base. We was talking about this on the other side of the screen in the in the in the virtual green room. Yes, yes, man. <laughs> Which actually had some green in it. <laughs> and um, how it was a long time coming, and and, and just to look at uh, you know the podcast and the backdrop. It, it, this is a reminder, especially with that intro, reminded me of those shows I watched as a shorty in 1970, 71, a ten and eleven year old you know, kid and looking at the high level of, of power talk. Yes. Man. With, of people who look like me or had the same skin tone or look like my parents or whatever. And these discussions didn't have no music behind it. Every once in a while, James Baldwin had a square. <laughs> and they'd be <laughs> smoking. And yes. or I might have, you know what I'm saying? And, but the yes. discussions were like, they were like, they was like a good acidic. They was breaking down the barriers like acid, man, on Yo, the cable. It's it's crazy, man. Because when I, when I think back, I always uh, I always be like, man, I wish if I grew up in this decade or this decade or this decade or this decade, you know. And I always think about, well, what's the what what's the best, right? And you know, when I go back and think of our ancestors and think about our existence pre-slavery to pre-equality. You know, I often delve into the idea of emancipation. Mm -hmm. You know, every, every, everybody says that Abraham Lincoln emancipated the black American. That's what right. they say. Mm -hmm. You know, but even before we get into whatever legislation was made, the concept of emancipation, the fact that us as a group had to be emancipated from another group mm -hmm. yeah. opposed to the fact that we are still trying to free ourselves. And we got to this place pretty much based on the work that we did. And these people that you talked about providing all this conscious discussion, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I, I hear you when you say that, but I, I, that's also tied in. I think we could be, you know, relevant in saying that I've often thought, 
Like, I'm glad I didn't come up in that generation. <laughs> or I'm glad <laughs> I didn't come up in that that 10 to 20 year period between 1840 and 1860. <laughs> like, nah, man, I'm not really, you know, I, I'm feeling that where we're going with this planet, where we're going as a society, where we're going in the area of science and things like that, I think the future is the best time for those that are ready for it, man. And those that are prepared to look, to look at these things, not in astonishment, but like a, like the gadgetry and the technology, but looking at it as, as, as a horse that you can handle, man. I mean, you no, just don't jump course. on a horse without figuring out how to ride that horse and not to get bucked, so to speak. Uh, no, so absolutely. The these, these things are around us, and and it, it takes a bit of a collective to grasp at the same time. Um, I think um, I think the future is not our enemy. Oh, I totally agree with you. I mean, and and you know, I'm I'm one of I'm one of those that always see our progress. You know, mm-hmm. we mm-hmm. were somewhere we're now getting into a better place and you know it's it's just getting better i mean you know and it's interesting because the when when we talk about getting better i love to think about the euphemisms that we have right Mm. so you know if i facetiously ask you what's your pejorative of choice you know what would you say and i want to i want to actually talk about something you said in in an article in 93 um, you said you think of yourself as black and see nothing wrong with that, being that you have been born in the U.S. and have lived here all your life, opposed to being called African American. Right. Uh, you know, it's almost three decades since '93 when you said that. Like, how do you feel about that right now? Well, often I look at the the 28 year old or the 33 year old or the 40 year old or even the 55 year old with a different lens as we go forward. Yeah. So you also have to be honest with yourself sometimes to say, damn, I was full of piss and vinegar and bullshit then. <laughs> damn. But, you know, we evolve, right? Yeah. So, um, but there's certain things that you hold on to because th- those strands go further back into your core existence of who you are and, wh- and what you come out of and who you come from. So yes. I was always told that, you know, we black folk, we black. And, I, and I, you're talking to a person that was old enough to have Negro on their birth certificate. And for the first 10 years of my life, Damn. we went from Negro in 1960 on my birth certificate to colored around the civil rights. I'm, you know, I remember the Civil Rights Act and asking a question as a five-year-old, like, you know, <laughs> Civil Rights Act, okay, what is, Damn. you know, at the same time I was getting, at the same time I'm getting the polio shot. So wow. we were colored <laughs> Damn. at that time. Damn, yeah. Adrian, we were colored, we were colored <laughs> folk. Right. The proof of colored folk, whenever you saw black folk on TV, we all be yelling, yo, colored people on TV, colored people. We want the colored people to win. We were colored. But then by the late 1960s, there was this full court press and initiative that black would be the term, whether you pro con, like it or not, you feeling or not feeling it, whether you have Baptist or Muslim or it, black is going to be where it's at. And it was pushed. It didn't come, I didn't, it just didn't come automatically. It came from a fact that you had, you know, Black Power, Black Panthers, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Black was a bad word, man. And 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 even then, the, everybody had their philosophical little, you know, areas of difference. That was the narrative that everybody kind of hung their hat on by 67, 68. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then cu- culture came in and co-signed it, whether it would be the, the covers of, of Ebony that co-signed it, along with James Brown saying, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, and, yes. losing, and losing his white audience off yes. of it because yes. he had white kids singing it. Yes, yes, <laughs> like, yes. So all that, all that figured in by, so this is the tripped out thing, going from Negro to colored to black by the end of that decade makes me right. not only a child of the 60s, but so deeply rooted in the ethic of of the 60s man that that is something that i carry with me in the 21st century going into the third decade knowing that this is my core i've been 116 countries so i don't get up i don't get up caught up with how the united states of america with its um with its primitive way of looking at a constitution slipped up and dropped the ball on what they considered race to be or was you know what I'm saying? So it's like, 
you slipped up on, on trying to determine what a race is out of the human race. Right. And you come up with these, these cockamamie rules that say that, uh, you know, this, this, this percentage of blood, <laughs> I mean, oh, I, yeah. the one drives like, my, yeah. I mean, really seriously, that's, that's that's the the logic of an idiot, man. And then that actually gets enforced into being a constitution, which, by the way, that you have to look at it as the area the, of of the regional law of of the yeah. of the p- part of the planet Earth, and the world is cut off. So, I mean, it's too easy to say um, black, and it's easy and it's fitting for everywhere for the people who are uh, or outside of the of the of the of the philosophy that white folks are pure and the purest of all pure white folks come from the place that you know they they happen to come up with this thing that they beat into all of us called english so <laughs> so you know we we have the option right to go right. into that dynamic and and, and and shuffle the deck a little bit because yeah. Because they don't even know the ball they're carrying in their own end zone, so to speak. Exactly. So, so I mean, to, 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 to say that yes, black covers it, man, and and fear of a black planet was basically saying that hello, it's already a planet of color, and y'all come out of that. You don't govern that. You come out of that. Wow. But but then I mean, and, you know, and going into um, that album. And I'm 30 years old at the time, making music uh, in a genre that people considered bastardized and also, um, well, intellectual as well as being, um, what do you say, when you're uh, adolescent, so to speak. And here I'm taking a, a, a dissertation or philosophy right. or, 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 or a pretty much a, um, a principled study theory and making a rap album out of it fear of a black planet so that actually was that's looking at that whole aspect of color confrontation and theories it's interesting um because public enemy is is part of my youth you know um, uh-huh. to the point where you know it's it's an interesting question as as a, as a record collector people say yo what's the first record you ever bought right but I mean, your parents uh-huh. were always buying you records when you grew up, so it's not necessarily what record you bought, because they even bought me little Sesame Street records, right? Right. So right. My, did, did, my, they buy the one with the, did they buy you the one with the Sesame Street beat? I had the Roosevelt Franklin, the Funk, the Beats, but I, uh, and a lot of them are those super plasticky ones, like the thick, yes. the thick, thick ones on the little. But anyway, I say this all to say. Seldom am I asked what is the first piece of music that you stole. Okay. Right. I remember going into the warehouse. You remember the warehouse, the store of the warehouse? Yes, yes. I remember exactly. going in there yeah. and and stealing Welcome to the Terra Do Maxi single. That was right. my first, that was my first cassette that I ever stole. I never I never was no crazy thief or anything, but I was such a fan of you guys, man, because you really started to uh, just open me up. I mean, you just started opening me up to seeing things I never really considered, you know? That was, that um, was a job, Adrian, for sure. That was a job. I mean, the, the, the deal was is to, is to be like a gas yeah. giant. <laughs> it's somewhere in the gas. You know, gas giants are good and bad. Gas giant means that you got a lot of hype going on around you and People start getting caught up in the rings, <laughs> or there's many layers that go down to until you get to the core of what that that orbit is. So the the old core, what the orbit is, is different from the exterior where flavor says nine one one is a joke like right. that, or or we hit out a bunch of different things that to get you caught up in in the motion, and it still got to make you. I mean, we coming through the area of music and culture, so you got you got like that old Junior Walker record. You got to shake and finger pop, man. And I feel you, but it's interesting because, you know, you guys were constantly viewed by the white media as, as black radicals, like a nonsensical uh-huh. tension to the guard spreading hate opposed to consciousness. Yeah. When you were teaching me uh-huh. real history, 
You know what I'm saying? So like, it's interesting. I, when, when, I think the key, the key was also is we always tried our best, especially after 1987, to to drag the the diaspora in it as as our as our bodyguard. Yes, yes. So 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 when people start getting into this United States of America discussion, and we scoured the whole lower 48 tours and all that, you know, yeah. we were already planted seeds around all parts of the world that didn't you know, make us seem like we're so dependent on what the media here in the United States even ever cared. Because once I had my freedom papers, my passport, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Once I had that, yeah, there was nothing here in this territory which would make me blink an eye. That, that, that makes sense, you know? Yeah, um... I, they, I, they could say anything. It was like, I'm like, you know, like, all right, you know, They'll come up with something in the Times or L.A. Times or Houston Chronicle or whatever about what public enemy is and public enemy ain't. And my discussions, and even with El Paere, you know, or in different countries in not only the northern hemisphere of the world, but in the southern hemisphere of the world where you're dealing with the, with the dynamic of different continents and the different way that they looked at uh, race, colorism, even though a lot of the same BS is there in different ways, but I expanded the field, so to speak. So expanding the field makes it a little easier for us to drop a, a seed to you, but not only so you can sit and learn, which is debatable, but, uh, you know, and it's, it's uh, what they call it, um, uh, subjective, but so you could challenge information. That's what that's what Don't Believe the Hype is about. Don't Believe the Hype was actually formed out of Noam Chomsky, believe it or not. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's and the Noam Chomsky thing was like, not to believe it, but challenge information. Because, um, you know, in hip hop, and as you well know, and as a connoisseur, it's like, you got to kind of run head, to, head, heart, and hip with the technology of that time. Absolutely, that's what you. That's what you do. So you know, you understanding that 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 this this the gadgets, whatever, is a is a portal to the world, and um, and and we had to understand that. So we knew at this particular time with these new gadgets coming into the marketplace, um, that misinformation is going to you know, metastasize. Mm. <laughs> and, and then and then when you prepare, and the biggest difference here, Adrian, but somebody asked me, what's the biggest difference between Fight the Power 1989? And they also, they, you know, a lot of people look at that and only to know that that's the second Fight the Power. The first Fight the Power I was influenced by. Just on one word, bullshit. Mm. All right? So we had, when we tried to cover a scenario for Spike's movie, the same feeling and the sentiment that I felt in 1975. You talk about post-Nixon, mm -hmm. New York City, y'all drop dead. We ain't giving y'all nothing. And just, the, 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 just the, the area where black folks were in the middle of, Osley Brothers said, you know what, all, look, look at this bullshit. 1989, Fast forward, the biggest difference between 1989 and 2021 is that there's people who were in the mix in 1989 who are no longer here, bro. Yeah. And there's people who are in the mix right now who were born in the 90s, and many of them in the adult fold, born in the year 2000, you know, they're here now. So right. a lot of times we have to watch when we say the word we. Because we say, damn, damn, didn't we go through this before? I did. Right. So no, at 60, no. I can say I've been through that. I've been through that. I was also through 1975. That's why I said that to, to age gracefully is, is, a, is um, it's a gift. It's a, uh, I forgot the word. Uh, uh, of course, it's a blessing, but it's uh, um, something that, that you take and say, this is an asset to me because I'm able to, to tie the errors together, make comparative analysis and then as an artist songwriter musician culturalist or somebody in working in film like regina king just did with with um with night in miami to truncate this down into something that you could put in and deliver really in, in quick bites into the into the receivers of this time and the receivers and the receptors of this time ain't going to be holding on to the ball for long man they're going to take it 
run with it on to the next play. You know what I'm saying? So you got to know what they have. You got to you got to throw it so they can catch it. Absolutely. I, I remember, you know, I was a kid when I saw Do the Right Thing in the movie theaters. And I, I mean, it just, you know, it just blew me away, obviously. But I mean, that, you know, Fight the Power just took you guys into a whole new plateau. And, and you know, the the lyrics that really hit me was, you know, Elvis was a hero the most, but he never meant shit to me. You see, straight up racist. That sucker was simple and plain. Motherfucking man, John Wayne. That shit, I was like, yo, what? I ain't supposed to be fucking with Elvis. I'm not supposed to be fucking. And then I just started doing my well, research. Well, 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 we 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 as a as a as a demographic going through three different <laughs> categories of bill, what we're being called during that same period. We getting OD'd on Elvis and John Wayne. Yeah, where would Elvis this come from? It's the king of mu- music, and it's the king of 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 movies. Right. But then, what does John Wayne represent? I mean, he 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 expressly was a racist and and reading jim brown's book is really what made me kick that 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 back up regurgitated in the lyrics because jim brown said he was a p you know a piece of you know what so right. jim brown who's like one of my heroes and somebody you know when i read jim brown's books out book out of bounds i got it and i said you know what jim this is wow. on me you know what i'm saying elvis was a little bit of a different dynamic because not knowing so much about, you know, whether he was a racist or not, it was what he represented. What every yes, is exactly. like the Proud Boys all going to stack up? Is is it Trump <laughs> or is the, is the Proud <laughs> exactly. Boys? Exactly. Yes, like, no, totally yeah, it. it's, they just saying he going to be the king no matter what. Yes. That's what that was pointing at. Right. And then also the 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 whole other Elvis thing was is like me in the seventies, man, as a teenager. I wasn't looking at 1956 Elvis. I'm like, they're giving this dude, like, this dude's a straight out Nixon dope head NRA dude, man. You know what I'm saying? I don't know nothing about the humble Elvis with Sam Phillips in 1957. All I know is this yeah. dude's on TV all the time, these corny ass movies, and all of a sudden he's, he's gun toting with Nixon on drugs. And at the same time, we getting criticized for a bunch of things as a black demographic of exactly. high intellect and high, and we getting jailed left and right. The Black Panthers, yeah. you know, I'm here nine years old. See, the thing is, like, I can't unlearn it. <laughs> right. No, I feel you. I mean, I can't, un- I can't unlearn Fred Hampton and Mark Clark at nine years old in Chicago being shot. I can't unlearn it. And so you're saying that right. it happened. So, the the way it works today, they can try to figure out how to digitally unlearn somebody. Try to like, you know, it's like three card money, Adrian. It's like, yeah, this we told you the information, but we made it disappear. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's that's what you do when you conquer a country. What's the first thing you do, right? Right. They you couldn't make the it dis- They couldn't make it, once they put it out there, they couldn't make it disappear in the past. Why? You had solid things, you know, that we had to read that we kind of held on to, whether it was exactly. true or not. We held on exactly. to it. We, we froze the moment. You can't really freeze the moment on the grid. Absolutely, man. You know, it's interesting, and people don't really realize what Nixon's war on drugs did to our community. You know, how that even came to play as far as him want to get rid of all the opposition for Vietnam, him being a racist, you know? And, and so like what you're talking about is what, what Elvis represented. He represented that institutionalized racism. He represented something that when you, when you look back at now really illuminates where America was and also highlights in many ways where America still is, you know? Yeah. yeah the, the, the drop kick that I experienced as, as a young man in my twenties was, was the decade of R and B, or well, the twelve, uh, the twelve year period of R and B? That was the drop kick that really kicked our uh, communities out of bounds, and that was Reagan and Bush. That, yeah, <laughs> yes, bro. Let me R&B. tell you, man. <laughs> when I tell the cat man straight up and down, like yeah. when it come down to voting, I got caught up in the voting technology early. In the day. Not to say that we should never vote and not vote but understand the game. And when you come in and, you know, I'm coming in the first time I'm I'm able to vote, bro, is 1980. Mm. 
You know, I'm 20 years old, right? Couldn't vote in, seven, you know, 78, not for the president thing. And so Jimmy Carter was in. And then, okay, now, damn, man, but I want to go in the vote and instead of Jimmy Carter, man, Angela Davis is running. I'm voting for mm. Angela Davis. Right. And that was noble. That was, you know, that was the noble yeah, thing course, to do. Of course, yeah. It necessarily wasn't the mathematical. Uh, <laughs> right. Prim- the, the, it's because voting here is primitive. It's primitive. It's either A versus B, you know, Coke and Pepsi, right? But me, I'm like, you know, man, I'm nah, I'm clairvoyant, man. I'm like, I'm going to spread my wings. Angela Davis is what I want to see. Right. And that was the trick bag with that. And we got 12 years of Reagan and Bush policy, which allowed a lot of the same termites in the Nick, Nixon administration to go in there and just seal the deal on us. Exactly. So, so how do you say these things? And, and you make it a rap record in by 1986, 87. You don't say all those things. You just you hint at a lot of things. Yeah, you know, you know, I always say that hip hop is a brief college of the past. It it is a conduit to the past, and you guys continue to carry the torch. I look at Public Enemy as the Muhammad Ali's of my generation, to be honest with you, man, because you guys were despised by many in the in the in the media, mm-hmm. and now you guys are loved so much. You, you think so? You think it's love? I know so. I know so, bro. You an icon, bro. I mean, on I, both you know, sides. You know what I'm saying? You, uh, like, you know what? Uh, uh, Basketball-wise, sports analogy speaking, <laughs> I grew up Nick fan, right? Live bird kicked our ass. Yeah. Right? At the game <laughs> is over and everybody's retired and all, you end up loving that that competition and you ended up having a lot of respect. <laughs> right, right. And that type of love for Larry Bird, but really serious right. in the moment. He was busting your ass. <laughs> and he busted my team's ass and sent me home crying many a time. <laughs> yes. Public enemy was a situation where, yeah, we came, we wasn't trying to take no martyr L's though. Right. We wasn't trying to take the L. It's like, well, we were we gonna be the sacrificial L. Like, we even try to be Christmas addicts. No. We took the thing that that backed the boldness of public enemy is saying, well, man, we got the diaspora, man. Mm. We got the diaspora. When you think Africa don't mean shit, we well, you know what? Straight up and down, we got Africa on our back. And you and you can't leave here and go anywhere else and not not see Public Enemy if you like rap music. So you cool. You could you could condition the room that you in. You could make us unpopular. You could not put us anywhere. And the minute you leave the United States, you go to France. You go to places like you know Australia. We've been there. We planted seeds. It's a tree and a coconut will pop on your head. That's, that's what we set out to do in 87 because we knew that the love that would be here is, is going to be it's going to be gadget love. It's going to be mosquito. It's going to be like, yeah, oh, you're popular. We say like, we can't do something. We could we could hint at popularity, be popular for a minute, but popularity doesn't last. Got to give them the, the style. But the substance has got to be someplace where it's that, yeah, it's hard pill to swallow. But you know what? Wherever I'm working, this restaurant going to work over there. No, I feel you. You know, it's it's interesting because if if we're looking at the messaging of uh, you know older activists, uh, let's just, let's just say MLK, yeah, versus the Fred Hamptons versus the Malcolm X's. There were two, you know, kind of different sides of the same message, you know? Uh-huh. But, like, when we talk about blackness, we're talking about that power. And 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 pride and confidence in one's race shouldn't really be perceived as a subjugation of another. So, like, my question to you is that would you perceive blacks as being racist if the definition of racism is defined as a belief that one's own racial group is superior to that of another particular racial group. In the United States of America, it's compensation. You got to <laughs> believe that you're even fucking superior just to come damn near halfway to the fucking resume. <laughs> I mean, shit. Muhammad Ali said, I am the greatest. He wasn't just talking about boxing. He had to that. He's like, yes. call me my name. I, I'm d- ditching the Cassius Clay from Louisville thing to tell you that we are the greatest, but I know if I say I am the greatest, you're really going to be mad. Exactly. <laughs> you know exactly. We, when we say that, that we are 
are black people around the world and we are the world, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That by default is 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 inviting and embracing everybody into the human family that black people have been kept out of or the Absolutely. darkest people of the world. And if you do the mathematical s- studies just to get primitive like that into one, two, three, four, or five, mm-hmm. if you had to count money and look at on, on these standards, the poorest nations of the world and the richest nations of the world, you get the simple numbers. You get the simple, you know, blocks of information like, oh, all these people are black on the poorest. And all these people at the top of the world, they're white. So when the things get that primitive, how far are we away from cave mentality being the rule of thumb? Well, America is derivative of a slaveocracy, right? So, I mean, it's not, it's not a place where we had enslaved people. It's a place where our rules from slave codes to black codes were all based on the concept of pr- protecting, you know, this manifest destiny, this white imperialism. So, I mean, like a lot of people don't necessarily understand those connections. And it's people like you that help to, that have helped and continue to help spread the consciousness just to understand who we are because we have been masters of turning absence into presence, right? We never really had opportunities to do the things that we wanted to do. I mean, this takes me just to blackface, the concept of blackface and performing in blackface, to performing as a caricature of your culture because this is their first time that you could actually make money in America as a black person, pretending to be black, you know? So it's like there's all these things that we had to do to get to where we are right now, and we're still doing that. So, I mean... Oh, well, we get to where we are right now culturally. Can you climb to the shelf that Bob Marley is on? He is a person from a biracial situation. And his whole thing is like, we can win the world with love. Yes. Now, once love starts going and you talking to somebody who don't see themselves as not none, not in your family and you are a, a biological threat to end their their characteristic existence. Yes. You got all these other, you know, illogics that's poured into that gumbo, man. Then, you know, that was, damn, man, I don't want to go to war, but damn, how many ways can we go to war to diffuse your bullshit? (laughs) Exactly. And Bob Marley simply would be like, yeah, just love, man. It's like, you don't want, but you don't want that. You want to switch that love and turn it around to to the misspelled word of evil. (laughs) (laughs) So, no. so even when, when we get to our most peace and our love and understanding and just that in the pocket, you know, because of the lack of, I don't want to say humility, because those are, I guess those are all social constructs too or responses, but uh, just the lack of openness that love will set this uh, layer of mankind free enough to steer the world just keep it on track, not drive it into the ditch. Absolutely. And that's that's a key thing. So Bob Mar- Bob Marley is a shelf. Bob Marley is a shelf we aspire to that that many of these or these uh what would you call it? Uh like treadmilling <laughs> generations mm-hmm. keep running and doing the same thing over and over again. So as close as you think we get as a society to that shelf, you conveyor belt keeps knocking people down two shelves below. Like that fresh faced kid in Charlottesville became the kind of the poster child when he ran over that woman, right? And he was yes. 20 face, 20 year old face. And it's like, wow, man. It's like this this cat was born in like 1996. Now, <laughs> how the hell does he act just like <laughs> his great 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 grandfather, great great grandfather in that area, Charlottesville, Virginia, mm-hmm. in 1919, the year of the uh, the Red Summer riots, when this animosity built up on black people who all of a sudden like, well, I, 
fought in World War One. So exactly. I mean, I ain't getting there. Like, nah, nigga, you you back here. Matter of fact, we ain't yes. want you back here. You know, a lot of times also the diaspora also is like a GPS to all those movements if you're paying attention. Because I remember very clearly, like, and I think you remember too, man. Uh, um, of course you remember because in the same sphere of time when. Cats in, in France was burning every car they saw, especially within the, the Parisian uh, perimeter. Burning, they was burning every car. They wasn't taking it to the streets now, as much as like we're gonna protest with our human bodies. They were so upset at the uh, French government. Cats set every f- car they could see mm-hmm. on fire, and a lot of people was like. What, the, what does that mean? And that used, that came from the from what had happened in, the, in one of the suburbs, and you know, you explained to a USA or like <laughs> what suburb means, like in other places, is that when Peugeot and all those car plants in the seventies and eighties said, "Look, we need workers in these plants. Y'all ain't living in the city. Yeah, we set up these little townships outside suburbs." And with these the close to the car plant, so y'all could work and enslave in them spots, and we're gonna take y'all from Mali, Cameroon, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, so you know, Benin, right? And we're gonna have y'all all come live in them areas. But then when the car plants closed up, they they like, oh, y'all out there, we're not servicing y'all. I mean, we don't know how y'all, but they expected those folk to move back. Mm. They're like, no, you invited us to come up. We ain't in, in in your, you know, French takeover African territory, though, even if you call them independent, <laughs> they're really not. Now we back up here to live, and now you want us to go. We're not going back. Right. So when these areas stop getting serviced, these quote unquote suburban areas, right? Which means the opposite in these spots. It's like, yo, yeah, that's a ghetto in the boondocks, right? That yes. we just ain't servicing. They was like, nah, we're going to go and burn Paris down. We're going to go in the city, catch the train, and burn a car. So when you have these discussions on all these little areas that go on around the world and you try to have a cognizant discussion with somebody in the United States that feel that they got their own, they, it's the only problem in the world is what they're facing in front of their eyes. I said, man, the diaspora is the only thing that's going to set you free outside this box that you're in. Absolutely. There ain't going to be no answer in the 48th state, and the reason I'd say lower 48 is because one territory, the least, west, north, south, box of the United States of America is going to set you free without connecting to the diaspora, even for just ideas of freedom. So if you don't don't feel uh, uh, the anniversary of when Patrice Lumumba was 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 taken and 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 assassinated, and yet still you want to get your weed from you know from that spot in Antwerp after you left Amsterdam and stuff yeah. like that, and then you know you can't put the two and two together, man. You're gonna be you're gonna be a part of the generation that's gonna get knocked three steps down because you can't climb up to what Bob Marley was truly talking about and and peace and love, and that getting to that area where we can drag people forward. But that's just, that's why they call it struggle. You know, it's, a struggle. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting because you have always been a real black intellect. You came on to the scene. I mean, you was like 26 when you came on the scene, you know, and you already had your degree, but you was being taught from young. You know, I know you was like, in middle school, you were going to... uh like summer programs where uh-huh. you began taught by Black Panther. All, 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 all of us, African American experience. Flavor, Hank, Griff, ever, all of us apart for that area. We went to um, Afro American experience in 1970 and 71. You had Panthers, you had people in the nation, uh, Islam, you had community leaders. And these cats were, low, you know, Adrian, these cats were 19, 20, 21, 18. They were our counselors. Wow, I mean, they, they're a little rough on the edges, too. Like, if yeah. like if you did something out of line, they'd take it to your ass. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, hey, hey bro, 1969, <laughs> 1970, yeah. man, your little black ass got got whooped out, right? Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. Most of the thing is authority saving your ass. <laughs> oh, yeah, little black ass got whooped out. He'd be all right. 
<laughs> you know, but you, you know, it's interesting because, you know, one of my, one of my really close friends, someone who I work with daily is Ali Shahid, you know? Oh, yeah. That's, and, that's and, okay. and like, he speaks of you so highly. I mean, he looks at you as the person who really steered him right. Cause you know, his first tours w- were with you, you know what I'm saying? Oh, and like, yeah. like you have this commanding omnipresent patriotic type voice where you provided context for all of us as we grew up over the decades. There's young people just hearing about public enemy. There's young people reading your books have nothing, have no idea what music you've done. But when I, when I look back and just read different articles about you, you know, I think about the younger Chuck, today's Chuck. And there's something that you actually said where you said you didn't want to grow up and be an older rapper. Do you still feel the same way? Because you got so much to say. I mean, and you don't got to say it through rap, but, you know, Jazz musicians play till they die. I don't know. I don't. I don't recall too much of those 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 statements where I said I don't want to be an older rapper because I already was. And from minute one, I was ten years older than the pack, or eight years <laughs> older than the pack. So I knew I would do this for a long time. I used to be the guy to tell the fifes. Who said, yo, man, I'm doing this for five years. And now you'd be like, so what yeah. you going to do? Open the cleaners, bro? This yeah. is what you do. This is who you are. Now, what I also was clear explaining, yeah. I was saying that I'm going to always present exactly. something yeah, that's yeah. rather obtuse, out of left field. It's going to be Mingus-like. It's going to be like right, right, shit right, right, that right. you probably don't like, and popularity won't understand. And I don't give a fuck because I'm from the art background more than from a political background. The political that comes I just came with with the package of the times yeah. you you I mean it wasn't this like, I'm gonna be this political and I want to be looked upon as a deity and a saint hell no if I'm with a 60s mentality then really serious Adrian I'm normal yeah that was normal at that time now it goes ahead and people might look at what I'm revered as but they give me credit for something that's really seriously was average in 1969, 1970, 71. Average. Because there were so many people in that period of time, you're like, whoa. I mean, listen. Yeah. Huey Newton, you know, if you look at a story today, they talk about, okay, you know, the Panthers had guns. When I was growing up, my my thing was like, the, the Panthers got degrees. That's the thing that bugged me out, and I guess that's just, that was also Cointel Pro. Seeing Kareem Abdul Jabbar, he wanted me, he made he made me want to go to UCLA, man. Before wow. I even know what Eucla was, man, I was like, I don't even know what Eucla was, but this dude, I seen him like graduating. It's like I'm the I'm wow. in, people used to be envious of intelligence back mm-hmm. in those days. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there would be cats I would go around, and, and see, it's my it's my story to give people the aura of the times and real and real speak real time to give them the soul of it. You could capture a little bit of it in film, and even maybe even less of it in music, or maybe vice versa, switching route, whatever. But when you have a conversation with somebody, you can bring the essence of that period. And say, cool. Oh yeah, that's some bullshit. When I have a conversation with my father, as much as I'm reading, I could read about Harlem in the '50s, which is a dark period, right? Because mm-hmm. how much black right. life do you read about in the '50s? Right. That's post Renaissance. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. And you know, you could get Renaissance. You could get '60s when things became more like like together. Right. '50s. 50s, it's you got to talk to that person, that aunt, that uncle, that father, or go through the photo album and start asking questions. Absolutely. That's the difference that doesn't cross over. Number one, don't cross over. If you don't read no book, then you ain't going to get no none of that. You, you, you're you not even going to begin to understand a, a Zora Hurston's when she gives gives it into, like, you know, black slave, slave post-slave speak. And <laughs> you just, yo, man, that's going to be hieroglyphics yeah. from Neptune, man. But you need real people 
to be able to bring it across. Like my dad would be like, yeah, I know what you're reading, but nah, they ain't happen like that. This is what happened. <laughs> yes. And my dad would break it down in, in the three or four sentences. You swear he was a warlock, man. Damn, but man. Dad is like, oh, oh. He said, yeah, that's sort of right, but that happened over there for them, and this happened over there. Like It wasn't that complex. It really was really simple. And then policing, you know, the police walked the beat. They knew everybody's family. Yeah, they still do the do on you. Not like right now what happened when they stopped service in Harlem, the mm. guys coming from different areas looking at you patrolling through with tanks. That's a whole different level of bullshit there. Mm. You got to have a real conversation with a real person. But also, it's a race against time, Adrian Young, because when those people transition on, if they never wrote their story down, it wasn't documented, or, or, or you know what I'm saying? The only thing you got is, is the real-time conversation where that soul goes to your soul to Absolutely. tell that real story. Absolutely. The green story is important because it takes, you know, soul to soul to soul to keep the story fresh and live. Yes, there is something to digital capture. Yes. And of course, yeah. documentation course, through yeah. music and, and and film and all that. But also, you know, as a musician, and this was told to me a long time ago, when a dude like Ray Charles passes, that shit is gone. Yeah, you got man. recordings, right? That, and you could emulate and just get note for note and all that. But whatever that shit that's deep down in this core, when it's like it's here, and it's gone. It's into the universe again. And you got miracles that pop up here and there, but they 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 got to be determined and they got to be determined and judged in their own context, in their own area and space. And then you got to go in there and figure out. Well, how could it be in a bad, in a good, I guess in the best way, processed for a movement forward? And that cultural and the arts actually is supposed to accent, in my opinion, like how does it ride with a forward movement of us as a, a, a as a being, as 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 a protecting and some sort of a defense against all the shit coming at us? And how does it be a, an embracing thing where it rides us all on the same, you know, uh, ship sailing on those waters? Absolutely. Well, I mean, posterity is key and, and it's up to people like us. You know, we have kids. We have daughters, you know. Um, it's, it's up to people like us to change the sanitized view that we were taught as a youth, as, as being young, you know, reverses educational sterilization. and Give people the truth like you gave me, in a, in, you know, and I want to thank you for everything that you've done for our culture, for everything that you've done around the world, for everything that you continue to do, man. And uh, me and you got some stuff to do. You know? Yeah, <laughs> because... yeah. I, I say the joy, the joy in anything I do, yeah. anything I do is like, how do I extend this energy to salute and praise people like yourself and make you reach the areas you're trying to get to. Thank you, man. That's that, you know, the, the utmost joy. Like when people try to throw, throw whatever at me, I'm like, yo, man, I'm not going to get more famous. I could get more infamous. And really, and money is just a, is a construct or whatever, I, I, you know. Right. But the spirit and the joy that, that I have is to see people like yourself go to high, yeah. high positions so it can metastasize, man, the best of our, of our interest in human spirit. Yo, check this out. This is Chuck D, Public Enemy Number One. You are tuned and locked in to my man Adrian Young on Invisible Blackness, all right? Keep it locked. Let's go. Mm -hmm.